You know, in the Bible, God tells Abraham to kill his son. Why would God do that? God also tells the Israelites, don't plant two different types of crops in your vineyard and that homosexuality is wrong. So why would Christians say, hey, having homosexual sex is wrong, but be okay with people planting two different types of crops? Like, what's going on there? So listen, today, we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff like that, these things in the Bible that can be very difficult to understand, because we've got something that will actually help you understand how this is supposed to be interpreted today in the Bible. You know, when I was in high school, I played trombone. I know you couldn't tell, but I was a total geek, okay? I, I was in like three hours of band my senior year of high school, and I was in the marching band was one of them. And so in marching band, you hold your trombone, you, you start playing, and you march on the field. Well, we were at a football game, and there were thousands of people there. I lived in Kansas City. It was a big high school. Football was huge. Thousands of people in the audience, and it was coming up to my solo. So I'm marching around. I'm getting ready to go up front where I jump on this huge box and blast this solo to everybody. And we also had a drill team. They're dancing around with these huge flags, waving them around. Well, at the end of my trombone, at the end of a trombone slide, there's a little thing called a spit valve. It's like a little metal hook. And she's waving this flag around, one of these 50 girls. And as I'm about to go up for my solo, she whips her flag. My hook gets caught in her flag. And she's like whipping it around. And I'm like trying to jump and catch it. I'm like, stop. And she's like, I'm dancing. I'm just like, she didn't actually say that. <laughs> but, but I felt like it, right? She's just like ignoring me. I'm like trying to grab my Finally, I got it. I ran up there and played the solo. But ooh, a trombone in pieces doesn't do music, right? Right? You have to assemble it. Unless you assemble it, it's completely useless. Now, let me bring that to the Bible. We read the Bible, and a lot of times we read it in pieces. One book here, one book there. But when you read it in pieces, it doesn't make the music God intended for it. It needs to be taken as a whole, assembled all together. The problem is we tend to read this one piece at a time. And we're talking about why not to do that today. Go ahead and write this down. Our idea for today is called Knit Together. The Bible always has a bigger picture in mind than we do. Each book of the Bible, each story in every book, and each paragraph of every story is part of something larger than themselves. Additionally, the Bible should be read through a Christocentric lens. This is a big word here, Christocentric. We're going to come back to that towards the end of the sermon, and I'll explain to you what that means. It's part of being knit together. But if you were to look at this, it, it kind of sounds like I'm saying, hey, read the Bible in context. But it's actually a little more than that. It, it's more than just read the whole context. It's when you read the book of Genesis, that's the very first book of the Bible, there's things in there that reference the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Have you ever worn something that was knitted? We're calling this knit together because if you pull on a string on a knitted shirt up here, you'll feel it tug down here. You know what I'm talking about? So if you pull on Genesis, you'll feel it tug on Revelation. That's what we mean by the Bible is knit together. It's all connected and we need to understand how it's connected or you'll miss the big picture, the music overall. Let's write this down too. The Bible has 66 books with over 40 authors. That's a lot of books, right? A lot of different authors. And it was written over a span of 1,500 years. Now, that's a huge span with lots of different people, but, and it covers the entirety of human history. And if we ignore the fact that each book fits with the overall story, we're missing some really big ideas. So yeah, 1,500 years worth of writing, 40 different authors, but God had his own purpose when each of these people wrote. God influenced them to write in such a way that the guy writing the first book was referencing things that the guy writing the very last book was going to talk about. And the books in between, it's all knit together and woven together. Listen, this whole series we're doing right now called Cracked is about how to interpret the Bible correctly. And if you listen to everything else we talk about in this series, but you miss just this today, the Bible is going to seem like a random collection of good ideas. But that's a nice book. That's a nice story. That's a nice idea instead of what it truly is. And what is it? It is one wisdom from God pointing to one main idea over thousands of years. And if you miss this one topic today, stories like Abraham sacrificing his son won't make sense to you. Why the Bible has different rules for divorce in the Old Testament than it does in the New Testament will seem like a contradiction. If you get this, though, it will all make sense. It will be like someone had a giant puzzle laid out, and you finally brought all the pieces together, and there's the painting right there. It's going to take hard work, though. And we're not afraid. Are you guys afraid of hard work? 
I hope not. We're going to do a little hard work today with our minds. When you go home, you're going to do a little hard work, research in the Bible. We're going, to, we're going to do the hard work because the memory verse for the whole series is 2 Timothy, and it says, do your best. Work diligently. Work really hard to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. That's the Bible. We want to correctly handle it. We don't want to treat it lightly. We don't want to misread it. We want to handle it the right way, but it takes hard work. This is our memory verse. Let's go ahead and read this out loud together. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. All right, good. So we're going to dig into this. Uh, you know, the acronym cracked is what we've been talking about. Let's just make sure we remember these words. First one was context. Right? We read not just a Bible verse. You read the paragraph or the page or the chapter to understand. Don't take things out of context. Reveal. The Holy Spirit reveals the truth to you. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit opening your eyes, you'll never understand the Bible. You'll read it and go, this makes no sense. So we pray, Holy Spirit, help us understand this. The author's intent. To understand the author's content of the Bible, you have to understand the author's intent. Until we understand what the author's trying to communicate, we're going to go, what does this mean to me? Doesn't matter what it means to me. What matters is what the guy was trying to tell me, right? Credibility, that was last week. This is like innocent until proven guilty. If you read something in the Bible that don't make sense, you gotta dig deeper. You gotta dive deep. And today we're talking about knit together, and I think you probably already understand knit together, because it's a pretty simple concept, right? Stuff written in one part of the Bible is connected to stuff part in the other part of the Bible. That, that's pretty simple. So let's just jump in and do some examples. This is Genesis chapter three, very beginning of the Bible. Now at the beginning of the Bible, you have Adam and Eve, and they live in a place called the Garden of Eden. Okay, perfect place, perfect people. And they're in there and Satan comes to them and Satan tempts them. He's, he's disguised as a snake in the story. He tempts Eve to eat a forbidden fruit. She eats it and she convinces her husband to eat a forbidden fruit. And now all humans are damned to hell because we rejected God and chose that fruit. So God's mad at Satan. And this is what it says in Genesis 3. So the Lord God said to the serpent, and just to be clear on this, the serpent is the devil, okay? So God says to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust. Remember that verse? You will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay, so what is this talking about? One of my favorite atheist websites, and yeah, I have favorite atheists. I love to go to atheist websites and read because... They have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to the Bible. Like, they have the weirdest interpretations, okay? And I love, I've got friends who are atheists, but you guys are just so off. Okay, they're talking about this phrase, eat dust. You know what they say about the Bible? This is what they said on infidels.org. Snakes, well built low, do not eat dirt. <laughs> really? They read in the Bible that God says Satan's going to eat dust, and they're like, well, snakes don't eat dust, so the Bible's wrong. I don't, I don't, they didn't say it like that probably, but <laughs> they're trying to find a problem with the Bible, right? And woo, they sure got us on that one. Snakes don't eat dirt. Is that what it means? I mean, is God trying to teach us a biology or a zoology lesson right here? No, that's not the point. What is this really about? Well, let's read the Bible, knit together. So I got a, a net here. This is going to help us understand how the Bible is knit together. Give me just a moment to set it up. So we've talked about how everything works together in scripture and how one book references another book and all that. So, sound like it's gonna hit me in the head. All right, it might. All right. Just, just don't laugh at me if it hits me in the head, Marco. All right. <laughs> okay, so right here, we got this net and over here, we've got Genesis chapter three, what we just read, okay? And on the face of it, it's like, oh, snakes eat dirt. That sounds really stupid because we all know snakes don't eat dirt. But the Bible is knit together. When you pull on this, it's moving stuff over here. So what's going on over here or right in the middle? You have to take it as a whole. So let's go to Luke chapter 18. Now in the Bible, it's divided in half. This is the Old Testament. This is when Jesus, God's son, comes to earth, and this is the New Testament, and this is where everything changed, okay? So you have Luke, this is about Jesus. It's when Jesus comes to earth. And what does Jesus say about Satan in Luke chapter 10? Jesus said, 
I saw Satan fall from, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So according to that verse, where did Satan used to live? Okay, he lived in heaven. He does not live in heaven anymore. Let's go to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 12. So now we're tugging on here and we can see it's moving up there. So Revelation chapter 12 says the great dragon, and this is talking about Satan, right? At first he was a snake, now he's a dragon. It's all a metaphor. The great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So what does this verse say about where Satan lives? He lives on earth. That's right. And so when you have Genesis saying, Satan, you really screwed up. From now on, you're going to eat dust. Where did he used to live? He used to live in heaven, but now he lives on earth. When God says in the first book of the Bible, you're going to eat dust, he's not saying you're literally going to eat dirt. He's saying you're going to live on earth. That's what it means. That's why we have to understand the Bible's knit together. If you don't understand that, you're going to be reading this going, snake don't eat dirt. Bible stupid, right? Come on, Neanderthal. It means more than that. <laughs> I just, if, you, if you're the guy from infidels.org that wrote that, I don't think you're a Neanderthal. I think we just act like it sometimes. Also on here, uh, oh, by the way, yes, yeah, someone, someone texted in. This, this is, yeah, okay. I was making fun of atheists, right? But someone texted in and pointed this out. I've heard Christians that try to argue that ancient snakes ate dirt. Okay. <laughs> I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I love other Christians. But let's just be honest. Sometimes Christians are weird. <laughs> Can we just admit that? Sometimes Christians are, And sometimes we believe weird things. I don't know. Like sometimes you get a Christian going, well, by golly, the Bible says snakes eat dirt, and so I believe it. The Bible says they eat dirt, so they eat dirt. And say, but clearly, snakes don't eat dirt. The Bible says it. Got to believe it. Okay, well, sometimes the less someone knows about something, the more dogmatic they are about it. You know, have you ever felt that? Like when you don't know anything about a topic, like you got big opinions about it. And some of these people, they read the Bible and they read that snakes eat dirt. And so they're just like, well, God said snakes eat dirt. Don't you believe the Bible? Well, of course we believe the Bible, but I believe the Bible's knit together and that God was making a bigger point right? That's what it's about. So atheists or Christians like that, yeah. Uh, sometimes we miss the point by, by not understanding how the Bible's knit together. There's more, some of them too say like, oh yeah, he, he will crush your head, right? The, the, child, the offspring of women will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is why people don't like snakes because snakes were cursed. So they're going to bite people's heels and we're going to stomp on their heads. God predicted it. That's not what this is talking about either. You know what this is talking about? This is called the Proto-Evangelium. I'll come back in a second. If you read in the book of Luke or book of Matthew or the book of, book of John, you're reading about Jesus. You know, Jesus came to earth. And when Jesus came here, he died as a sacrifice for our sins, right? On the cross. And then he rose from the dead. What was going on? He died. What did Satan do? Struck the heel of Jesus. Jesus died. I bet when Jesus died, Satan thought for a moment, oh, this is going to work. This might actually work. We just killed the son of God. But Jesus crushed his head. How do you do it? By rising from the dead three days later. And so you get this. It's called the proto-evangelism. Proto means first. Evangelism means the good news about Jesus saving us. The first news about Jesus saving us was in the third chapter of the Bible. He's going to crush Satan, even though Satan's going to bite his heel. Right? Jesus died, but he rose from the death, and Jesus wins. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? The Bible actually says, hey, if you believe Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead, and you ask him to forgive you for your sins, you accept the fact that you should have been punished, but he was punished for you, then you will be saved. That's a beautiful, amazing thing. And God planned it that way from the beginning. Now, it's interesting, this knit together thing started in Genesis chapter 3. It went all the way to the, when Jesus came to earth. You're talking, if you're a young earth believer, 3,000 years if you're an old earth believer like me, maybe 100,000 years, that's a lot of time difference, isn't it? That's why we have to understand how the Bible's knit together because you can't just take any one verse all by itself. If you don't understand how the Bible's knit together, you won't get it. You'd be like, weird story about a snake, weird story about a guy dying and rising from the dead. Let's go ahead and write this down. Example of knit together. The Bible begins in Genesis with a story about a snake being crushed. 
And it isn't fulfilled until thousands of years later in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when Jesus dies and rises again. You know, a couple weeks ago, we looked at this verse. It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Prophets are people who write the scripture. So Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, he wasn't writing about snakes. He's like, you know what I think? I think snakes are filthy. And look at them crawl. I think they're eating dirt. That Moses, no, that's not how Moses wrote that. How, how, how did that get written in scripture? The next verse says, for prophecy never had its origin in human will. It's not about human will. But prophets, though they were human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit picks these people up, carries them along, gets them to have every single word that God wants them to use. Now, was it written in the own style of each human? Yes, because he carried along those humans. It's their style. But every word is exactly what God intended. God's the only one who could have written Satan, you're going to eat dust. Satan, you're going to bite a heel, but we're going to crush your head because God's the only one who saw that thousands of years in advance. Does that make sense? This is why it's important to know that God wrote it and used humans and why it's important to understand it's knit together. Let's, let's do another one, okay? We're going to ask the question, who controls the earth? And the Bible gives three different answers. Deuteronomy chapter 10 says this, to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Okay, so according to this verse, who owns the earth and everything in it? God does. Let's look at Matthew 4 now. The devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. According to this verse, Satan thinks he's the one who owns the earth, doesn't he? Let's look at Psalm 115 now. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he's given to mankind. Well, which one is it? Who owns the earth? Humans, Satan, or God? I mean, if you're just going to read one verse at a time, like an atheist or like a simple Christian, you're going to go, well, I think God owns the earth. Well, this one says Satan does. Well, then Satan does. You know, you're going to get confused. So what's the answer? How is this all knit together? Well, God, who inspired that first one to be written, also inspired these other two to be written. So what does that mean? How can we reconcile that? It's pretty simple, actually. God owns the earth, right? He owns it. And he's going to own it forever and ever. But God delegated that ownership to humans. If you're a boss or a parent, you know what it means to delegate something, right? You've delegated authority. God has delegated authority. We control the earth. But Satan, Satan took control of the earth when we sinned and he was cast down to it. He's stronger than us. So now Satan is the one who's in control of this earth. And all you got to do to know that is look at the way governments function. Sorry, I didn't say that. And then God is going to come back, destroy Satan, and re-delegate the earth to us. And we're going to be in charge of it for all of eternity. So who is in charge? Is it us, Satan, or God? The answer is yes. <laughs> but until you have the Bible knit together, it sounds like a contradiction, right? But until you understand how it all works, it's, it doesn't make sense. So this is why you have to understand the Bible's knit together. There's different things happening, and God's trying to explain it all to us at the same time. Now, let's get even more complicated. Let's talk about the seed in the field, the two different types of seed and homosexuality and how that works in scripture. Because this is a big deal nowadays. And, and before I even get to that, let's just, let's just be straight up honest about Christianity versus homosexuality. For a lot of years, people in America treated people who were homosexual very poorly. They would abuse them. They would beat them. It was wrong, wasn't it? And anytime the church participated, anytime a Christian participated in anything like that, it was wicked and evil. God calls us to love everyone. Sometimes the clock ticks back and forth, right? It has swung that way. Right now, the, the clock has swung this way, and churches are saying it's not even wrong. And so we need to be in the middle where we say, hey, this is what God says, but also we love people. And I'm not, we're not going to not love anyone just because they disagree with us. Our goal is to, we would give our lives for another sinner because Jesus gave his life for a sinner. There's no one in here who's better than anyone else out there. Is that true? It's true. We're all people in need of God's grace. And we've got to love everyone no matter what, even when they hate us for not approving of what they do. All right, that's, that's how we approach this. But let's just read this quote. This is Lori Goodstein. She says this. Yes, it's true that the Bible says some nasty things about homosexuality. 
It's also true that the Bible forbid anyone from wearing mixed fiber clothing or planting due to different kinds of seed in their field. So her point is, you guys ignore the seeds stuff. You plant whatever you want nowadays, so you should ignore all those other rules too. So we have to ask, which laws are reflected in what's called the New Covenant, the New Testament, and which laws are not? And so you have in the Old Testament laws like do not mix your crops in one field. In fact, let's go ahead and read Deuteronomy 22. It says this, do not plant two kinds of seed in your vineyard. If you do, not only the crops you plant, but also the fruit of the vineyard will be defiled. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Do not wear clothes of wool and linen woven together. Make tassels on the four corners of the cloaks that you wear. So you got like a lot of laws over here in the old covenant before Jesus came that are kind of strange. Now, along with those laws, you also have other laws like in Leviticus 17 about who you're allowed to have sex with. And there's like an entire chapter about those sexual laws and how that's supposed to work. How is this reconciled with, with reality? Are these things still evil or not? Why do we plant these crops different? Why do we plant two crops in one field? Why can I wear a shirt with two different fabric nowadays? Well, until you understand how the Bible is knit together, you'll never understand this. If you remember last week, I, I recommend you get a commentary, a book by Tony Evans that helps explain the Bible. Well, he was writing in that commentary, it's a good book, about these laws, about the laws about not having two different seeds in one field. And this is what he said. The common theme in these verses is the mixing of unlike things. Teaching the Israelites to recognize distinctions would help them see the importance of being holy and distinct in a sinful world. Paul, so he's going to talk about a New Testament Bible verse now. Paul uses a similar idea to do not plow with an ox and a donkey together when he warns believers not to enter into partnership with unbelievers. So Tony points out here, the whole point is God saying, hey, I don't want you to mix these things together. Why? Because I really want you to learn the lesson that things that aren't like each other don't mix together. So that when you decide what kind of relationships to be in, if you're not supposed to be with this person, you're not supposed to get with a person. We come all the way to the New Testament. So we're going to read now from the book of 2 Corinthians, okay? And we're going to see how these work together. Paul explains what those laws mean. He says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Yoked, uh, a yoke is this like thing that would go around an ox then around another ox and would tie them together so that wherever they go, they have to go together, okay? He says, don't be yoked. Don't sign a contract. Don't be in a relationship. Don't marry a non-believer if you're a follower of Jesus. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Nothing. What the fellowship can light have with darkness, right? A light bulb cannot be in a relationship with the darkness in your closet, can it? Because it's one or the other. And he's saying, if you're a follower of Jesus, then your goal in life is to serve Jesus. Your mind is set on God. You want to pursue the kingdom of God more than anything else in this world. What you want is to follow God. If God tells you to burn down everything in your life except for him, you do it. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, that's nonsense and you would never do it. So why on earth would you put yourself into a relationship with someone who sees the world fundamentally differently than you? It doesn't make sense, Paul says. And these laws... Back here, uh, the Deuteronomy law is about the seeds. The point was, yeah, don't put two different types of seeds together because you put things that are different together, it doesn't work out. You're a holy person. Do not be put together with someone who is unholy. It doesn't work. But what you have with the sexual laws are laws that are repeated in the New Testament. So you have laws like this, the, the seed laws. Those are not repeated in the New Testament. They are fulfilled. They're, we're explained, okay, well, what that law was really about was something else. But then you have laws about sexual behavior, and those laws are repeated in the New Testament. Yeah, that, that's what it really was about. God really did mean it. And so that's why we reject, we don't plant two seeds anymore, but we still accept some of those sexual laws because they're repeated in Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, Matthew chapter 19. If a law is repeated in the New Testament, it's for sure real. But many, many, many laws in the Old Testament were only a shadow pointing to a reality. That's a theological term, a shadow. Let's write this down. Theological terms. A shadow is a fuzzy picture of the reality. The Old Testament contains many shadows or types of the reality shown in the New Testament or, or to be shown in heaven. These shadows are real life metaphors, analogies, etc. Okay, so... 
This, this is an airplane shadow. If an airplane flies above you, you can see the shadow on the ground. Now, can you learn something about an airplane from the shadow? Sure you can. You can look in the shadow and be like, okay, well, there's two engines on this plane. Uh, the size of the cockpit compared to the body is, uh, this is probably a passenger plane because that's a large body. You know, it's got someone more knowledgeable than me to be able to know what kind of wings these are. You can learn a lot from a shadow, can't you? Just like in the Old Testament, you read that, you can learn a lot by reading these shadows. But if the real thing is here, why not just look at the real thing? Because now I know what color the plane is. And now I can see exactly how many windows are in the plane. You, the reality is better than the shadow. Does that make sense? So if you're reading something that's a shadow in the Old Testament that was written thousands of years ago, and then you get to something written later on in the New Testament, this is much more clear. So, okay, we don't have to obey those old laws anymore because they were only a shadow pointing to a reality. We care about reality. Does that make sense? The seeds were only a shadow. So while you're thinking about how things are connected together in the Bible, if you're reading the Bible and you read something in the Old Testament part of the Bible and you're like, that doesn't make sense, go, wait a minute. Maybe it's just a shadow pointing to a bigger reality in the New Testament part of the Bible. Okay, we got, uh, got some comments and questions here. Let's answer those. All right. This person says, I see a lot of donkeys and oxes plowing together in today in America's churches. <laughs> yeah. The world and the church mixed together. The church trying to conform to the world. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of donkeys, donkeys and oxen plowing together. You know, I've been a pastor a long time, and I've seen this again and again and again. Someone comes to church. They're a single person. They're not in a relationship with anyone. And they love God. And they're getting on fire for Jesus. They're starting to follow Jesus. They're starting to change their life. And like this lady, she's on fire, man. She's doing what God wants to do. She's getting in Bible studies. And then she sees a guy she likes. Ooh, hey. And we're like, who's that? She's like, I don't know, but he's cute. And uh, so she starts talking to him. And we find out this guy does not love Jesus, not like you do. And so we're like, you know, you probably should chill out. Like he's not. And she's like, well, maybe I'll invite him to church. Well, you know what that guy's going to do if you invite him to church? He's going to come to church because he wants to have sex with you, okay? I'm dead serious. A guy will go to church for years if he thinks he'll get you to sleep with him. I know because I did something similar with my wife. We didn't have sex before we got married, but I used to go on walks with this woman like every day of the week. I hate going on walks. <laughs> The other day, my wife was like, Jeff, why don't you go on walks with me anymore? We used to go on walks all the time. I'm like, because I married you now. I was trying to get with you. <laughs> Am I telling the truth, guys? We will put up with all sorts of nonsense to get the girl we like, okay? That guy is going to come to church with you as long as he thinks it might get him what he wants to get out of the relationship. Then you're going to get married, and he's going to stop coming to church with you, and you're going to be trying to raise your kids to love Jesus, and he's going to try to raise your kids to, to drink beer. It's going to be a different mindset. And you're going to be torn because you're scared your kids are going to go to hell now because they're not following Jesus because it's a lot more fun to go out on the lake with dad on Sunday morning than it is to hear me yell at them for an hour. You know what I mean? And your, your heart's going to be broken because you didn't obey. You yoked yourself to someone you had no business yoking yourself to. You, if you start to like someone who's not a serious follower of Jesus like you are, you need to stop liking that person. And people say to me, well, you can't, you can't stop love. Bull crap. I know you can stop love because I did Weight Watchers. <laughs> And there were, I used to weigh 265 pounds, and there was all sorts of food I love, and I chose not to love it anymore. You can stop love. It's just hard. You know what I'm talking about? I did it. Weight Watchers. All right. So you can stop love. It's just a decision you got to make. Does that make sense? You got to make this. You know, I'm not going to like them. I'm not going to be interested in them. This person said the, the ox, oops, don't exit yet. No. Uh, the ox and donkey question made me think about the wheat and weeds parable. Some weeds shouldn't or wouldn't be uprooted until the end judgment. This person's talking about a story Jesus told. Jesus says, hey, um, there was a field and there was wheat coming up, but there was also a bunch of weeds. And so they came to the farmer and they were like, hey, should we take the weeds out? And he said, no, man, if you take the weeds out now, it'll hurt the wheat. So just leave it until harvest time and then I'll, I'll get the weed out and then I'll burn the weeds. Jesus says, that's the church. He says, there's wheat here, there's real Christians, but there's also weeds in the church. And the reason God allows weeds in our church is because if he were to remove everybody who wasn't genuine, it would harm the church right now. 
So he's going to leave you here, even if you're not genuine for now, but you will be burned up on judgment day. And so it's important to remember, just because someone's coming here doesn't mean, just doesn't mean they're a genuine follower of Jesus, right? We got we to gotta be careful in those relationships, not to yoke ourselves to people who aren't serious about their faith. This country doesn't understand the agriculture and farming background, but being from that background, it's so much clearer. Oh yeah, I mean, there's so many stories throughout scripture that if you understand farming, like it'll, it'll make sense to you too. I read the other day that some atheists were converted because of the sheer complexity of DNA. What do you think? Oh yeah, that's, that's true. Um, if you, I don't want to get all the, you, you just go to truthrevolution.tv and type in DNA. That's Pastor Dave and my uh, podcast. The complexity of DNA, it's so complex that you, it could not have happened by random chance. I mean, one amino acid, this is, the DNA is way more complicated than this, but one amino acid, the odds that one amino acid could form randomly would be similar to like you filling the entire state of Kansas with quarters, painting one of them red, throwing it somewhere at random, blindfolding someone, and then stepping out and picking the red quarter. Like, that's not gonna happen, right? S similar odds to an amino acid coming about by chance. If that didn't make sense, just listen to the podcast. All right. Truth. I got saved because my then girlfriend's parents hated me and it's a brown chicken brown cow. <laughs> I thought the church would get me closer to the goal. Then Jesus got me. <laughs> yeah. He just said brown chicken brown cow. Um, don't ever text that in again. All right. <laughs> No, but it's true, right? This person says it happened to them. Fortunately, Jesus got a hold of this person and changed their life. It doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen. If someone's not a follower of Jesus like you are, you can't, you can't, you can't do that. Okay, uh, let's go back to what we were talking about. I want to talk about the, the biggest shadow in the entire Bible. This guy came to me one time. We were shooting a video for church. He said, hey, can I ask you a question? He was a pretty new Christian. Been at our church just a year or two. And he said, you know, the church I used to go to was Catholic. When I, when I was a kid, we had a Catholic church. And they talked about Mary all the time. But here at Revolution, you guys talk about Jesus all the time. Why is that? And I was like, oh man, you asked the question. Like, this is, this is great. Because we believe Jesus is the son of God on earth, right? Mary, his mother, that's great. Blessed be Mary. That's true. But Jesus is God on earth. And if we want to understand how God works, we got to look at Jesus. And this even goes to the way we understand the Bible. Let's write this down. This is that Christocentric thing I said we would come back to. Christocentric, part of the Bible being knit together is understanding that Jesus Christ is pointed to, alluded to, and the entire point throughout all of scripture. He is the reality of many shadows. And to understand scripture, we should look through his eyes. So you got all these shadows in different parts of the Bible and they're all tugging on other parts of the Bible. But the main point of every shadow in every scripture is Jesus Christ himself. It's all pointing to Jesus at the end of the day. In fact, a guy named William Estrep was talking about Anabaptists. Our church is Anabaptist. He says this, for all Anabaptists, the Bible is the only rule of faith and practice. Okay, what he means is we don't have a pope, right? This is our rule. We don't have some leader out there telling us what to do. The Bible is our only rule of faith and practice for discipleship in the church. Biblical revelation was held to be progressive. What he means was the Old Testament here, showed us some of the truth. And as time went on, we learned more and more about God, okay? It was progressive. And the Old Testament was preparatory and partial. It was preparing us for something. Whereas the New Testament was final and complete. All the scriptures, they insisted, must be interpreted Christological, that is, through the mind of Christ. You have to take scripture all together and believe that all of it is pointing at Jesus. In fact, this is what Jesus himself said. One time he was talking to a bunch of people who were super religious. They knew their Bibles inside and out. They had them memorized. And this is what Jesus said to them. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life, but these are the scriptures that testify about me. That's a huge claim. Do you hear that? Jesus is like, oh, you guys been reading the Bible, the scriptures? That's nice. Do you realize that this is all about me? Jesus is saying, if you've read the Bible and you didn't see it pointing to Jesus, you've missed the 
point. Therefore, we want to look at how Jesus lived and taught, not just to make our life differently, but because all of the things we read in here are pointing at Jesus. What if we were go to a, a movie set and the guy with the video camera was trying to tape the movie star and everybody was surrounding the camera going, wow, that's a really nice camera. We'd be missing the point, right? The tech crew doesn't think that'd be missing the point. They'd be like, wow, I'd look at the camera. But, you know, so some people are enamored with the camera, but some people are enamored with the movie star. We should be looking at the movie star. That's the whole point of the camera. Camera. Jesus is the movie star. The whole point of this is to get us to Jesus. So when we read it, if we're misunderstanding something, why don't we turn to Jesus' words and see what Jesus said about it? Because Jesus is the one who inspired all of this anyway. Let's write this down. To properly understand scripture, we must see Jesus as the pinnacle of both Old and New Testaments. And all scripture pointing towards his life, death, and resurrection as the way of life and belief for us. So I told you I wanted to talk about one of the biggest shadows in the entire scripture. Why would God tell Abraham to kill his son? This is in Genesis 22. God comes to Abraham and says, you have a son, your only son, and I want you to go kill him as a sacrifice for me. Whew. Atheists look at that and they go, God is evil, the Bible's false. Christians look at that. I don't understand why God would do that. Maybe God was testing him, but what was the point? Well, let's go way back. I said, Jesus comes to earth here. Let's go way back before Jesus came to earth and read Genesis 22. And then we're going to read something that Jesus said about himself. So this is God talking to Abraham. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Why would God do that? Well, let's fast forward to Jesus talking about himself. Because remember, saying it's all knit together. Right? This is God telling Abraham to kill his son. Let's fast forward to Jesus now. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Listen, listen to this. God told Abraham, take your son, God's son. Your only son, Abraham, Jesus was God's only son, one and only son, whom you love. In other parts of the Bible, you read God saying, this is my son whom I love. He says, go in there, sacrifice him. And what was Jesus for us? He was a sacrifice for our sins. The whole point of God telling Abraham to sacrifice his son is because we look at Jesus sometimes and we don't think it's that big of a deal. But we read the book of Genesis, we read about Abraham, we go, how could someone sacrifice their son. That's so evil. That's so much. Why would God do that? And they're supposed to remember God sacrificed his son for you. And we're supposed to go, oh, that's a big deal. Because way too often we don't think it's a big deal. We're supposed to remember when Abraham did it, that's a big deal. And then look at God and go, that is a big deal. God sacrificed his one and only son so that you could live. That was the point. Abraham was a shadow of Jesus Christ dying for you. Now, there's other things in scripture too about this. Did you know that, that Abraham was told here to sacrifice the son, but, but just before then, God also told Abraham, Isaac's gonna have a lot of kids. He's gonna live a long time. Abraham knew Isaac wasn't gonna be dead. Abraham already knew. Plus, in the context of where they lived, in the region where they lived, did you know lots of people sacrificed their children to their gods? It was normal. And so God told Abraham to do this. Abraham probably thought, oh, so we're going to be like all the other people on earth. And then when Abraham went to sacrifice his son, God said, stop. I actually don't want you to do this. And in Deuteronomy 18.10, so another verse, just a little bit later, God actually says, I don't want you. It's evil to sacrifice your children. So God was actually using Abraham as a point to the people around there. You all sacrifice your children. That's not what I want from you. I stopped Abraham from doing it and I made a law that no one's to do it because you shouldn't do it. The only sacrifice of a son that actually was good was when Jesus was sacrificed for you and me and we're supposed to go, that's a huge deal. That's why God allowed that. Let's write this down. Why did God command Abraham to sacrifice his son? Foreshadowing that is supposed to make us horrified. Why would he sacrifice his only son whom he loved? That's a huge loss. Then we're supposed to look at Jesus and realize God sacrificed his only son whom he loved for us. It shows us the depths of sacrifice. Plus, God actually stopped Abraham before he did it. Hmm. So what do we do with all this? Um, you know, here's the practical stuff. I'm going to say one of the same things I said last week. 
If you, if you don't have a Bible commentary, you should buy a Bible commentary. You can write this down. Buy a commentary, right? There's so much stuff that's knit together. Not anyone, not even me, can know it all in my head all at one time. You follow me, everybody? So what do we do? We have these books called commentaries. And when you read the Bible, let's say you open it up to Proverbs 10. You read this verse, and then you can go to a, bo- a book called a commentary, and they make comments about it. They tell you, hey, this is connected to this other verse later on. Hey, here's what this meant when they said it 2,000 years ago. Helps you understand things that you couldn't understand on your own. Commentaries are a really good way. Now, it's going to take hard work, but do your best to present yourself to God and approve work when you do not need to be ashamed, but rightly divide the word of truth, right? We're going to correctly interpret the word of God. So, I want to get a commentary. We're going to get this. I actually got the book, Tony Evans Bible Commentary. It is so good. I mean, I quoted it today because I want to show you. I use it. It's, it's really good. Or you can get the Logos.com Bible software. It works on your phone. It works on a computer. They got one you can get for free. Now, I'm not a salesman. I'm not getting commission here. But they got another one that you can buy for 50 bucks. Say you buy the NIV Bible that we use here with it. 60 bucks. So good. Like, why would you not get this? This has multiple commentaries. It's not just one. It's like multiple commentaries you can have on your phone. If you read a Bible verse, you don't understand it. You just open the Logos app and say, what does this verse mean? And there'll be books there that tell you. Beautiful. Amazing. They've got bigger packages. Uh, you know, they have one here you can buy for that. Actually, that that. $50 one. They've got another one you can buy for 250 bucks or 100 bucks. That, that one for 50 bucks contains $1,400 worth of actual books. I've got an office full of books and a home full of books, and you can get basically most of those for 50 bucks, and it's not fair. <laughs> okay? It's not fair, but it's a good deal for you. Now, uh, last week, I also told you that if there was five of us that wanted to buy, because they got another package that's like 250 bucks, if there's five of us that wanted to get it, they would give us 30% off. Uh, five, we have five people who want to get it. So we're going to get the 30% off. If you want to spend 250 bucks, uh, go ahead and write big Bible sale on your red card, and you get like all kinds of commentaries. If you want the link just to read about it, just go to logos.com. You can buy anything there for $250 or more. You'll get 30% off. Again, I'm not a salesman. I don't get any money from them. I just want you to know the Bible better. That's all, okay? And like, I can hardly believe that in today's world, we get these phones that have all the commentaries that I've spent 20 years collecting. That's pretty amazing. So uh, if you don't get a commentary, at the very least, you should get a study Bible. At the very least, you should get a study Bible. Uh, This one's the Quest. I used it for many years. It's so good. What is a study Bible? Well, in our Bibles here, you know, we've got words. This is the actual Bible. What a study Bible does is it'll give you like maybe the top two thirds are the Bible but then it'll have like a square down here in a different color. And it says, hey, up here, this is what that meant. When Jesus said this right here, here's what he meant and why he said it. And here's the something else he talked about in the other part of the Bible. It gives us little comments here. It's kind of like having a commentary, but like a mini version of a commentary. So it's not as deep and not as thorough, but it's still really good. Uh, I don't think anybody should hardly read the Bible without having a Bible, a study Bible. So get the Quest Study Bible or just go to truthrevolution.tv slash know the Bible. And we listed a number of them there. Uh, Dave, you remember, we linked to one that was like an archaeological study Bible, right? I mean, if you're a nerd like me, like you could get this one and it'll be like, you know, they did this archaeological dig in this part of Egypt and they found this thing over here that matched this thing in the Bible. It's really cool. You can geek out with me. Okay, what else do we do with this? When I find something difficult to understand, I should look for connections between parts of the Bible. That's essentially what we're saying today. When you read, man, Abraham was supposed to kill his kid, or snakes eat dirt, or something that's strange, like maybe it was a shadow pointing to a reality. So look for different connections together in different parts of the Bible. God did that. But also, here's a warning. If people are finding weird connections and hidden meanings, that is not good and not what knit together means, okay? A guy named Dan who comes here to our church, a buddy of mine, he brought me this postcard he got in the mail the other day. And on the postcard, it was like, it's this big, black, really cool graphic design. It looked really good. It said, find secret hidden codes in the Bible. And we were laughing about it. We're like, I can't believe this guy mailed this. And then I realized... This was sent to thousands of people in Salina. And there are probably a dozen people who got this and went, I want to know the secret codes. There are no secret codes. Okay? There's foreshadowing, but foreshadowing is very different than conspiracy theory. 
right? There's no conspiracies. Like if you hold the Bible upside down and shine it through the light and smoke some weed, God's not going to reveal something to you. Okay. There's not, something will be revealed to you, but it's not from God. Okay. Like it's, it's not, there's no secrets that like, Oh, if you do it this way, you'll get something special. That's not, if you find people doing that, that's not what the Bible's about. Finally, I should see all scripture through the red words of Jesus Christ. The red words, you know, a lot of Bibles would be printed. All the words are black, but whenever Jesus talked, it was printed in red. The red words of Jesus are the most important for us because he's the pinnacle of all biblical revelation. And if you don't understand something else, look at what Jesus said about it. If you don't know why God wants you to do something, look through the words of Jesus. And remember that everything else in all scripture was pointing back at Jesus. Why Jesus? Listen, listen. I told you the beginning today that the Bible was actually just one wisdom. It wasn't a bunch of different ones. It was one wisdom pointing to one main idea over thousands of years. That one idea is Jesus Christ. John chapter one says, through him, all things were made. What was made by Jesus? All things. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Acts 13 says, through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Then it goes on and says, a justification you were not able to attain under the law of Moses. What does this mean? Moses gave you lots of laws. Don't put these seeds in the field. None of us can obey all these laws. Is that right? We can't do it. We've all sinned. We've all screwed up. But Jesus gave us a justification, a way to be free in the eyes of God by believing in him. Doesn't matter if you can't fulfill all the laws. Colossians 1 about Jesus says the son is the image of the invisible God. If you want to see God, look at Jesus. He was the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether it was a throne or a power, a ruler, authority, all things have been created by him and for him. Why were you made? For Jesus. You exist for Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, the fullness of God. Everything that God is was crammed into Jesus and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The only way back to God is Jesus. Jesus is the point of all scripture. He made all things that exist for him. And if you think you're going to get to God without Jesus, you have missed the biggest point in scripture. You cannot come to the Lord except through Jesus Christ. And today, if you know you need to come to the Lord and you haven't given your life over to Jesus, I encourage you to do that today. To mark on the red card, let us know you want to do that. And and Pastor Dave or I will give you a call this week. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. The point of it all is Jesus. Let's pray. (coughs) Lord God, we love you. And we ask you to help us understand your scriptures and to see Jesus and understand how it's knit together so perfectly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go study well.